What's up, everybody? Welcome in to the Philly Sports Power Hour. Hope everybody had a great weekend, a great Easter. Tried to have a good weekend. Tried to have a good weekend until Howie Roseman decided to ruin our Easter, ruin our spring break. Hold on. One second. Adrian Wojnarowski, Philadelphia 76ers star Joel Embiid is nearing a return and is expected to play this week. His status for Tuesday versus Oklahoma City is expected later today. Here we go. And that wasn't a Dallas Cowboys Dak Prescott. Here we go. That was a here we go for the 76ers. So we'll talk about that later. But big news drop by Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN. Joe LMB should be returning this week. Absolutely love it. Absolutely love it. But we'll talk about the Sixers because I want to start talking about the trade of Hassan Reddick. Now, some of you maybe tuned in to me this weekend on the radio, and you already know how I feel about this trade. And if you follow the Power Hour, you know sometimes I'm accused of being overly positive. I'm not one of these guys who's just negative for the sake of being negative. I will always tell you objectively how I feel. And I think this trade is absolutely terrible. Every single thing that Howie Roseman had done this offseason, to start this offseason, I thought was a good start. I thought that all of the moves they made so far this offseason were a good start. They couldn't be finished. There were still moves to make. It is still a long offseason. But trading away Hassan Reddick does not make you a better football team in 2024. And this move does absolutely nothing for you at all. It doesn't save you salary cap space. It doesn't bring you any draft capital that you can use this year. You can't even use it next year. This move does not make you a better football team. And we're going to talk about it because I don't like it. But first, I want to get a little roll call. Let me get a little roll call before I get all worked up. I am big bills today. I feel like Cilio today with how angry I am with the Philadelphia Eagles after that move on Friday afternoon. But we'll get into it. Let's get a little roll call because we're streaming live across Jacob Sports on YouTube. We're also live on Bill Colorillo Philly Sports Talk. We're live on TikTok. And I see people already saying we signed Huff. Well, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about them signing Bryce Huff and why that's not necessarily the answer. But let's get a little roll call. So I see Bry Guy checking in, my man flexing and stepping. Kyle Kokorski in the house, Crawley, CJ's used cars, saying, come on, Bill, we need somebody with positivity up here. You know I'm usually positive. If you follow the show, you know I am positive usually because there were a lot of things to be positive about. When this season ended, I was not one of the guys up here demanding Nick Sirianni to be fired. I was not looking at the season saying they don't have Super Bowl aspirations. I saw that there was a ton of salary cap space. They brought in two really good coordinators. So I was excited and I was hopeful for the 2024 season, but I can't sit here and be positive today when you just traded away your best defensive player. We'll get there. Let me keep going with the roll call here. CJ's used cars. We'll get there. Decoy Gaming, what's up, my man? Who else we got? Twiz in the house. Chuck Hutton. Kevin Savard. Bleed Green, Future of Men, Carlos Drew, Eric Gallagher. We've got a lot of people here today. I love it. Wolverine, or Wolverine, I should say. Soul Vane. Appreciate everybody being here. Bobby Mucherin, Eric T, checking in on TikTok. K 
Castiano season checking in on TikTok. Appreciate everyone being here. I want to talk some Phillies today. We'll get into the Sixers. We got to talk about the Flyers. Seven games left on a playoff push. So we'll talk about all that, but I have to start with the big news of the weekend. First of all, so if those of you who follow know I was on the radio Friday afternoon and I said to the co-host on the radio right before we went on the air, don't be surprised if Howie Roseman trades Hassan Reddick this afternoon. Kind of joking around because if you looked, it would have been the perfect time to announce a terrible trade. There's a reason why it was announced when it was announced. Don't tell me that Howie Roseman and the Philadelphia Eagles didn't already have this trade in place. I think they had this trade in place when Howie, Nick, and Jeffrey Lurie all spoke at the league meetings earlier in the week. But they waited until Friday afternoon. 4.30 in the afternoon, in the middle of Philly's opening day, right before spring break weekend. That is PR 101. That is how you tell the world bad news. Because it gets steamrolled over the weekend. Nobody could react to it. Everybody's at the Phillies game. Sports radio's airing the game on one channel. Ridiculous. That should tell you all you need to know about how bad of a trade this was. Because if this was a good trade, the Eagles wouldn't have stuffed it on a Friday afternoon. PR 101, man. That's when you release bad news. Didn't they do the same thing when they traded Donovan McNabb? Wasn't that like a, wasn't that Easter Sunday or something? Same thing. Anyway, here's why I don't like the move. Here is why I don't like it, and there's many reasons why I don't like it, and we're going to get into all of them. First and foremost, every single thing that Howie Roseman and the Philadelphia Eagles did to start this offseason signaled to me that they were going all in this year. It signaled to me that they were going for it this season because if you look around the NFC, there is no overly dominant team in the NFC. Yes, the 49ers are good. Yes, as much as I hate the Cowboys, they still have a good team. The Green Bay Packers are a good team. The Detroit Lions are a good team. But none of those four teams are so overly dominant that the Philadelphia Eagles didn't have a shot this season of going to an NFC championship game and maybe getting back to a Super Bowl. So everything the Eagles did to start this offseason, everything they did signaled, we're going all in. You brought in Vic Fangio as your defensive coordinator. You brought in Kellen Moore as your offensive coordinator. You go out and you sign Saquon Barkley, a running back, to essentially a two-year deal, okay? It's basically a two-year deal for Saquon because they can get out after two years. So you go all in, paying a running back, the amount of money you paid a running back, which I loved the move. I'm all for Saquon Barkley. But that signals you're all in this year. Bringing in Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, we're all in this year. Bringing in Devin White on a one-year deal, we're all in this year. But then you turn around and you trade your best defensive player. Your best defensive player for the last two seasons has been Hassan Reddick. This guy has never missed a game in his career. With the Philadelphia Eagles in two seasons, he's played all 38 games he's been in Philadelphia. He played 34 regular season games. He played four playoff games. And he single-handedly won you the NFC Championship game two years ago, knocking out both of the San Francisco 49ers quarterbacks. Single-handedly. And what I don't like is how quickly fans in this city turn on players. Now, it's almost as if Howie Roseman is completely immune to criticism now. You can't, God forbid, you say anything negative about Howie Roseman. And if you follow me and you follow this show, you know I like Howie Roseman. I think Howie Roseman is a pretty good GM. 
I really do. But it doesn't mean that you can't criticize him when he makes a bad move. And this is a bad move. But there are so many fans out there that, for whatever reason, God forbid you say something negative about Howie Roseman. They've taken the in Howie we trust to a whole new level. And now there are so many fans who have turned on Hassan Reddick. Where is this coming from? So the guy's 29 years old. He's going to be 30 in September, and we're acting as if he can't play anymore. Oh, they had to move on. They, they just had to. He's going to be 30 in, in September. They just had to move on from him. Do you forget that midway through the season last year, we were calling him the closer because of what he was doing on the field? How he would show up in the fourth quarter to close out games? Do you forget that there are only two players in the NFL who have double-digit sacks four straight seasons. Hassan Reddick and Miles Garrett. And you look at this guy, and I know there are people, well, you just can't, you can't pay him. He, he wanted a lot of money. You can't pay him. You figure out a way to pay him. I'm not of the mentality. There are some people who say, hey, he's under contract. He should just come back and play. Call his bluff. I disagree with that. He was unhappy with his contract last season. But guess what? Reddick was a good soldier. He made a little subtle comment in training camp last year that he was underpaid, and then he never missed a game. He had thumb surgery, had pins in his damn hand, had a cast, didn't miss a game. Still played over 70% of the snaps. Still gave you double-digit sacks. So I'm not buying all of this, oh, well, he's a locker room cancer. That, that's what it is. Fans just turn on players, man. They just can't stop. It's because Howie Roseman does something, and we take this in Howie we trust to a crazy level. And this is coming from me. I like Howie Roseman. I've been positive to start this offseason. But you can't look at this move and tell me it was a good move. Not when you get rid of a guy like Hassan Reddick. And I see on TikTok, Mr. C. Bradley saying, you weren't going to be able to afford to extend Slim Reaper and give Reddick $30 million a year. First of all, Reddick's not getting $30 million a year. And I'm very curious to see what the deal is that the New York Jets give him. I think it's going to be very similar to what the Houston Texans gave Daniil Hunter, who's also going to be 30 in October. Daniil Hunter got two years, $24.5 million a year from the Houston Texans. If that's the deal that the Jets give Reddick, I'm going to be even more furious because the Philadelphia Eagles should have given Reddick a two-year, $24.5 million deal. Extend the man. He's earned it. And I'm not buying the fact that, oh, well, he's going to be 30. I told you I was done with the 30-year-old safeties. Safety and corner are a lot different than an edge rusher. A 30-year-old edge rusher can still get after the quarterback. But here's why I hate the move even more. And there's a lot of reasons. But let's go to just the draft capital that they get. How does this help you? This season. And first of all, to answer Mr. C. Bradley that they couldn't extend Reddick and sign Devontae Smith, I'm not buying that. They still have 30 million in cap space. You don't save any money on the cap this season. Now, I know there's arguments that, well, you save 14 next year because of the void year. The salary cap went up a record high this season. And it's going to go up a record high next season because it's based off of NFL revenue. And revenue is through the freaking roof. With all these streaming deals now, they got Peacock's in the mix, Prime's in the mix. Because of all these streaming deals and these international games, revenue will be through the roof. So the salary cap will go up a record high next year. So I'm not buying that they couldn't re-sign Reddick and figure out a way to also sign Devontae Smith. They're going to be fine. And the one thing we know about Howie Roseman is he figures it out. You're still carrying a $20 million dead cap hit this season. $20 million dead cap. 
by trading away Hassan Reddick. You could have extended him. You could have lowered his cap hit this year, kicked the can down the road when the cap will go up even higher. You would have figured it out. But instead, you trade Reddick, not for a draft pick this season, not for a draft pick next season, a third-round draft pick in 2026. And people immediately, well, it's going to be a second-round draft pick. Uh, He's going to play 67.5% of the snaps, and he's going to get double-digit sacks, and they're going to get a second-round pick. If Hassan Reddick for the New York Jets plays 67.5% of the snaps, and he has double-digit sacks for the fifth straight seasons, I don't give a crap about the second-round pick you get three years from now. That man should have been on the Eagles' defense this year. So this is what I'm talking about where, well, Howie Roseman is a genius. I do like Howie Roseman. I keep saying it. I do. But when he makes a mistake, I'm going to call him out on it. And I don't see how getting a second-round pick three years from now, if Hassan Reddick balls out again this year, double-digit sacks, over 67.5% of the snaps, how that is worth a second-round pick three years from now. Not when you have signaled to me all offseason that you're going all in next year, bringing in Saquon Barkley on a two-year deal. Who gives a crap that you signed Saquon Barkley to a two-year deal, essentially, that you're going to get a draft pick three years from now when Barkley may not even be on the team anymore? I thought we were going all in this year. And there's more I don't like about this move. I like Bryce Huff. I was excited about the Bryce Huff move. I was really happy when they went out and got him. If it meant you were adding him to an edge rushing room that also had Hassan Reddick. But does it scare anybody else? Does it scare anybody else that the team that signed Bryce Huff to a rookie free agent deal, the New York Jets, and developed him over the last four seasons, who've had a close-up look at Bryce Huff for four years, decided that it was a smarter move to let a 25-year-old edge rusher walk out the door and sign a $17 million a year deal, $17 million, with the Philadelphia Eagles, and then turned around and traded away a third-round pick for a 29-year-old edge rusher who's going to be 30 in Hassan Reddick. Does that concern anybody else? That the New York Jets, who were supposed to be going all in as well this season, that they decided their team would be better this season letting Bryce Huff, the guy they developed, walk out the door for $17 million a year, and they just turned around, gave up draft capital, and are probably going to give Reddick a new deal that pays him more than $17 million. They thought they were upgrading. That scares the hell out of me. So as much as I like the Bryce Huff move, it scares the hell out of me that the New York Jets were willing to let Bryce Huff leave, and they're paying Reddick more money. And I know some people immediately think, well, the New York Jets, they're, they're, their franchise is a disaster. They don't know what they're doing. Well, I'll tell you this. The one thing they do know how to do is build the damn defense. Joe Douglas, their general manager, and Rob Sala, their head coach, know how to build defenses. And they looked at their defense, and they thought it would be a major upgrade, a major upgrade, letting Bryce Huff leave and bringing in Hassan Reddick. And you know why they're not wrong? Look at what Bryce Huff has done in his career. Bryce Huff has only played 17 games one time. And it was last all, it was last season. And you know how he did it? Only playing 42% of the snaps. He played 481 snaps last year. Do you know how many Hassan Reddick played last year? 862. Do you know how many Hassan Reddick played the year before? 817. And he hasn't missed a damn game. So I like Bryce Huff. I do. But now you're asking a lot of Bryce Huff and Nolan Smith. Nolan Smith played 200 snaps as a rookie. Bryce Huff played 480 last year. 
The year before that, he played 14 games, 190 snaps. Year before that, nine games. Year before that, 14. So now we're going to put all of our hopes in Nolan Smith and Bryce Huff. And best case scenario, best case scenario, Bryce Huff becomes Hassan Reddick. Isn't that the best case scenario? So we didn't upgrade our defense. We didn't make our defense better with this trade. We're just hoping and praying that Bryce Huff and Nolan Smith can match the production of Hassan Reddick. That would be the best case scenario. So you look at this defense last year, a defense that was one of the worst defenses in the NFL. And this offseason, the point of it was, well, we're going into this offseason because we need to upgrade our defense. We need to build back this defense. And you looked at the defense before Friday afternoon, and at least I said this, I looked at the defense and said, okay, they still have questions at linebacker. We've talked about that on this show. I still think N'Kobe Dean and Devin White are major question marks. You don't know what you have. A bunch of could-bes. They could be good. You look at safety. I like Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, but can he stay healthy? Reed Blankenship, what do we have? He's been up and down in two years. Sidney Brown blew out his ACL in week 18. Is he going to be ready? So what do you have at safety? Question marks. So now we have question marks at linebacker. We have question marks at safety. Well, what do you have on the outside at your outside corners positions? If you follow this show, you know I'm excited about Keely Ringo in year two. I'm excited if Isaiah Rogers gets reinstated coming off of a year off. I still think Darius Slay can play, but he's what, 33? So as excited as I am about Keeley and Isaiah Rogers, there still could be. They could be good. So you have questions at linebacker. You have questions at safety. You have questions at corner. Well, let's go to the D tackles. I like the D tackles. Jalen Carter, Jordan Davis, Milton Williams, Moro Ajomo, Marlon Tupolotu. I like them. But you probably got to put a question mark there, too, because you just lost Fletcher Cox, who played over 70% of the snaps last year. So there's still a question mark at your D tackle position because you don't know what these guys are going to do playing a majority of the reps without a Fletcher Cox there. So question mark. So you looked at that defense on Friday before 430 news dump by the Philadelphia Eagles, and you said, okay, question marks at linebacker, question marks at safety. Question marks at corner, question marks at D-tackle, but the one position you felt pretty good about were your edge rushers because you said, okay, we have Hassan Reddick. We have Josh Sweat. We brought in Bryce Huff. We got another year of Nolan Smith. They brought in Zach Bawn, who even though he's listed at a linebacker, is going to play more of an Andrew Van Ginkle role. So he's going to come off the edge. I feel pretty good about the edge rushers. And then what Howie Roseman and the Eagles did is they took the one sure thing you had on defense and they drew a big red question mark on that too. Because you don't know what you have in Nolan Smith. There's not a single person who knows what Nolan Smith will do when he gets more reps. And Bryce Huff, as good as he is getting after the quarterback, not only has he never played more than 480 snaps in his career, He's been horrible against the run. So that's an argument I keep hearing about Hassan Reddick. Well, he couldn't, he couldn't play against the run. Bryce Huff has been one of the worst defensive players against the run in his career. There's a reason why the New York Jets would take him off the field in running situations. They also, and I see Cody saying in the chat, did keeping Graham cost us Reddick? I don't think it did. But the Brandon Graham, that's another one-year deal that says, hey, we're going all in this year. We're going all in. But then we're going to trade away our best defensive player. And there's another thing I keep hearing from fans who try to make excuses for Howie Roseman. Well, Hassan Reddick doesn't fit Vic Fangio's scheme. That, that's what it is. Vic Fangio's coming in here, and Reddick doesn't fit the scheme. Okay, first of all, does everybody forget 
that when Nolan Smith was drafted and in training camp, he was being referred to as baby Hassan. And now all of a sudden, in one breath, you want to talk about how excited you are to see Nolan Smith in Vic Fangio's scheme. And then in another breath, well, Hassan Reddick doesn't fit the scheme. So that argument doesn't make any sense to me. And you're also going to tell me, you're also going to tell me that a defensive coordinator who has 20 years of experience can't figure out how to use the talents of a guy like Hassan Reddick. You can't figure out how to take advantage of the talents of a guy who's had double-digit sacks in four straight seasons, that you can't change up your scheme so that it works with a player of Hassan Reddick's abilities? Get out of here. I'm not buying that argument at all, that Hassan Reddick doesn't fit Vic Fangio's scheme. This was a bad move. And as much as I like Howie Roseman, to me, this was ego getting in the way. Hassan Reddick wanted a new deal. Hassan Reddick entered into a three-year, $45 million deal two years ago. Turned out it was a great, great signing by Howie Roseman. You give him credit for that move. After year one, Reddick thought he was underpaid. I disagree that Reddick should have asked for a new deal there. Although he was underpaid, you signed a deal, you played for one season, I think it was a little soon to ask for a new one. But then he came back last year, and he was a good soldier. And even though he got hurt, he didn't miss any time. He could have easily said, hey, you know what? I can't play through this thumb injury. He didn't do it. He played, and he played at a high level. And I know he struggled down the stretch, but the entire damn defense struggled down the stretch. He was a good soldier. He continued to play. He put up double-digit sacks again, and he said, listen, I don't want to play the final year of my deal underpaid like this. I want a new deal. Salary cap went up to a record high. He saw what other people were getting. He saw the Philadelphia Eagles turn around and give a guy like Bryce Huff more money than they were paying him. I don't care if you're a plumber, a lawyer, a doctor, a school teacher, whatever industry you're in, if you have been a good soldier, you haven't missed a game, you've produced four straight seasons, and you turn around and you look and you're like, you just gave this new guy who's only played 17 games in his career one time, who's only had double-digit sacks one time, who hasn't done anything for this organization, you, you just gave this new guy more money than you gave me. Oh, well, that's because the salary cap went up. Okay, well, can you take care of me too? You know I'm underpaid. You know I've given it my all for two years with you. I don't want to play in the final year of my deal. Can you give me a new deal? But for whatever reason, Roseman's ego got in the way because I don't want to hear that they couldn't figure out a way to extend Reddick. They absolutely could have figured it out. And when we get the numbers from the New York Jets, when we get the numbers to the New York Jets, if they've given him less than $25 million, I'm going to lose my mind even more. Now, if for some crazy reason, the New York Jets pay him over $25 million a year, if he gets like $28, $29 million, which I don't think will happen, I will recant everything I'm saying and saying, okay, all right, maybe that would have been a little too much to pay Hassan Reddick. But if they pay him similar to what Daniil Hunter got from the Texans, which was two years, $24.5 million a year, there is no reason the Philadelphia Eagles couldn't match that deal. And they should have matched that deal. Because as we try to build back this defense, this doesn't help you. Now, I'm up against it. I got to take a break. Because when we get back, I want to talk about one more thing that pisses me off about this, which is everybody out there saying, it's okay. Roseman's just going to draft an edge rusher. Like, that's so freaking easy for Howie Roseman or anybody in the NFL to just find an edge rusher that's going to produce like a son Reddick. I got to take a quick break. We'll be right back.
Imagine for a moment that you went to work today, and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian in my heart. I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you're having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. For the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. What's up, everybody? Welcome back into the Philly Sports Power Hour. Getting a little worked up today. And you know that's not usually my style. But I just can't take when I'm seeing things that I don't think are good moves. I just don't see how this helps you at all this season. If you were going all in this season, how getting rid of Hassan Reddick helps your football team. And while we were on break on YouTube, we were still live on TikTok. And people were saying, well, Josh Sweat. Josh Sweat disappears for extended periods of time. In fact, I'm looking at his stats from last year. It was the first time he's played over 800 snaps. He went 10 games in a row. Excuse me, eight games in a row without a sack to finish the season. 10 games during the season without a sack. He only had six and a half sacks last year. He's only had double-digit sacks once, and that was in 2022. So you're talking about Hassan Reddick, who's done it four straight years. And now there's people out there who are saying, well, it's fine. Because they're just going to use their 22nd overall pick on an edge rusher. They'll be fine. They'll just use the 22nd overall pick. Well, first of all, we are assuming that there's going to be an edge rusher at 22 that's worthy of the 22nd overall pick. So that's the first assumption you're making. But second, you're assuming that the Eagles are going to get it right. And this isn't necessarily a shot on the Eagles because most teams miss in the draft. It's just the reality of the draft. It is a crapshoot. But I just want to go through, and we're going to go back all the way until 2012. And I'm going to read to you every single edge rusher the Philadelphia Eagles have taken since 2012. And you tell me if you feel good that it's okay. They're just going to draft an edge rusher. 2023, they took Nolan Smith in the first round. I'm still high on Nolan Smith. I'm still hopeful he can do something, but he didn't do anything his rookie season. So if we're going all in this year, 
Nolan Smith didn't help out as a rookie. What makes us think whoever we draft this year is going to help us out in his rookie season? 2022, they took Kyron Johnson in the sixth round. Not even on your team anymore. 2021, Teron Jackson and Patrick Johnson. Sixth and seventh round draft picks. Not giving you anything. 2020, Casey Tuhill, seventh rounder. Not giving you anything. 2018, they took Josh Sweat in the fourth round. I'll give him that one. I'll give him Josh Sweat. But you know what Josh Sweat did as a rookie? Zero sacks. You know what Josh Sweat did as a second-year player? Four sacks. It wasn't until his third season where he played 14 games, he had six sacks. He didn't have double-digit sacks until his sixth season. Excuse me, his fifth season. So what makes us think that the guy they drafted 22 is immediately going to be able to contribute? 2017, they used a first-round draft pick on Derek Barnett. How'd that work out for us? The guy had more penalties than he did sacks in his NFL career so far. I know he's doing some things in Houston and people are losing their mind. He didn't do anything with us. He recovered the fumble in the Super Bowl. I will remember him forever for that. Great job. The ball bounced into your belly and you caught it. Thank you. 2015, Brian Mahalik, seventh round. 2014, Marcus Smith in the first round. How'd that work out? Taylor Hart in the fifth round. 2013, Joe Kruger, David King in the seventh round. 2012, Vinny Curry in the second round. And I like Vinny Curry. But he's not a son Reddick. So we just went all the way back to the 2012 draft. Anybody in there that's on a son Reddick's level? Anybody in there that contributed as a rookie? And it's not just the Philadelphia Eagles. You look at the last four drafts, the last four, there have only been five edge rushers taken in the first round that made a Pro Bowl. And it's easy to make a Pro Bowl now in the NFL. It's really easy. A lot of people make the Pro Bowl. But in the last four drafts, only five edge rushers taken in the first round have made a Pro Bowl. And all of them, except for one, was taken in the top 12. Four of them were taken in the top three. Last year, Will Anderson, taken third overall, made a Pro Bowl. 2022, Aiden Hutchinson, taken second overall, made a Pro Bowl. And Jermaine Johnson, taken 26 overall, made a Pro Bowl. He's the only one taken outside the top 12. 2021, Micah Parsons, who was drafted as a linebacker, inside linebacker, taken 12th overall, has made a Pro Bowl. And in 2020, Chase Young, taken second overall, made a Pro Bowl. That's it. So I don't understand fans who are making that argument. Well, it's fine. Just take an edge at 22. I hate this move. I absolutely hate this move. If it would have freed up a lot of salary cap space this year, and it would have made you more nimble to go out and maybe fill some other needs, then I could maybe come around and be okay with it. But it didn't do that. You're still carrying the dead cap of over 20 million. If it would have resulted in you getting more draft capital this year to maybe make a move to fill some other needs, maybe I could have came around on it. But it doesn't do that. It gives you a draft pick three drafts from now. I don't like it at all. Man. Wasn't expecting to spend 40 minutes talking about this trade. It just, once I get going on it, really pisses me off. Sorry, I didn't even get to some of the comments in the chat because I've just been rolling. But let's talk about the Phillies. We got to talk about the fight in Phils. So the Phillies open up. Two blowouts. Zach Wheeler pitches a gem. Friday opening day, and then turns it over to what was supposed to be the best bullpen in baseball. And they give up nine runs. They lose 9-3 opening day. Then on Saturday, they come out. Aaron Nola on the mound. Seven years, $172 million Aaron Nola. 
gives up 12 hits and four and a third, seven earned runs, and leaves with a 14.54 ERA. And the bullpen wasn't much better either. Gave up another five runs. So now the bullpen in two games before yesterday, seven and two-thirds, nine earned runs in two games. It was the first time since the Atlanta Braves were in Milwaukee when they were the Milwaukee Braves. You got to go all the way back to 1954 that the Braves had more than 13 hits in their first two games to start the year. However, and I was on the radio yesterday, and we were doing a quick crossover show, and the other host made an interesting point, is a lot of times we bring that football mentality to Major League Baseball. And what he meant by that was the NFL being only 17 games, every game matters. They win, we're feeling great, they're going to the Super Bowl. They lose, we want the coach fired, they need to switch quarterbacks. We overreact in football because the games matter so much. But you look at Major League Baseball, there's 162 games. We can't overreact to only two games. I didn't like it. And what I was basically saying all weekend was, it was two of 162, yes. But for me, the way I looked at it was, it was two of 13. Because you only play the Atlanta Braves 13 times. You don't play your division rivals as many times as you used to. So I know, hey, it's only two games. Well, it was two of 13. And if the goal, like we heard all of spring training coming out of Clearwater, if the goal was to win the NL East in the regular season, to catch the Atlanta Braves, well, then these two games really matter. And these two games, just because they're in April, or I guess March, we were at the end of March, matter just as much as two games do in August and September. So I know we don't want to overreact to two games, but these were important games. If, in fact, the regular season goal was to catch the Braves. And we talked about how important it was going to be for them to come out to a strong start. Now, here's the saving grace in all of this. Number one, they avoid the sweep yesterday. Thank God they avoid the sweep. Because it was close. Ranger Suarez gives up the two-run home run to start the game, and I'm thinking, oh, boy, here we go. So they avoid the sweep. And a lot of the reason they avoided the sweep was Johan Rojas beating out that double play ball. I know he doesn't bring a lot at the plate, but what he does in the field and what his speed can add to the base paths is the reason he's up here and not in AAA. So that was a big play because when he beats out that double play ball, they end up taking the lead because of it because they go on a little rally there. And the Phillies avoid the sweep. So if they would have dropped three straight, that would have been bad. But they avoid the sweep, but here's the good news. We talked about the importance of coming out to a quick start. Well, now the Phillies start 23 games against teams that they should be able to win every one of these damn series. They got the Reds, the Nationals, the Cardinals, the White Sox, the Pirates, and the Rockies. So six teams that the Phillies have a better lineup. The Phillies have a better pitching staff. So now's the time for this quick start to get going. Would have loved to have seen them win the series against the Braves, but they avoided the sweep, thankfully. Now you need to go on a run because last year they start the season 25 and 30. The year before they start the season 21 and 29. You can't do that this year. You got to come out to a quicker start. So Phil's back in action tonight. That's the nice thing about baseball too. Unlike football where we got to wait an entire week you know, or basketball, usually you're waiting a, a game or two. Sometimes they have back-to-back. Same things with hockey. Sometimes they have back-to-backs. But Phillies, man, they're on almost every single day. So I love that the Phillies are back. But speaking of being back, and I see people asking on TikTok, when is Joel Embiid coming back for the Sixers? I think it's going to be tomorrow night. I really think it's going to be tomorrow night. He traveled with the team this weekend. There was a video yesterday. There was a video yesterday of him working out, looking good, looking like there's no restrictions. I think Tuesday night, Joel Embiid 
is coming back. So I think tomorrow night you're going to see Joel on the court at the Wells Fargo Center. Let's hope. I'm hoping because I'm hosting a post-game show on the Fanatic after the Sixers game. I hope I'm talking about Joel Embiid. That's what I'm hoping. But last night, even without Joel, even without Tyrese Maxey, the Sixers set a franchise record with 24 three-pointers last night. 24 three-pointers. And I see my man flexing and stepping, getting on me because I'm not giving up hope on the Sixers. Wait, we, here we go, 76ers. Not giving up hope. Only because if they can avoid being the eighth seed, if they can avoid being the eighth seed, they will not have to face the Boston Celtics until the Eastern Conference Finals. Because of the way NBA works, the NBA doesn't reseed after each round. They do it like the NCAA tournament, which I think is ridiculous. You should reseed. If an eight seed wins, they should play the highest seed. You know, the, the better team should always play the worser team throughout the way the playoffs work. But if the Philadelphia 76ers just avoid the eighth seed, even if they're a seventh seed, they probably will not face Boston until they get to the Eastern Conference Final. So I'm excited. But Oubre drops 32 last night. Campaign drops 24. Nico Batum, 19. Season high for all three of those guys. And they win 135-120 against a team without Tyrese Maxey on the court against the Toronto Raptors team. So the Raptors have been playing bad basketball, but still a big win. So we'll see. Does Joel come back tomorrow? So I see in the chat, because I want to talk about the Fly Guys as well. I see in the chat people saying Drysdale's back tonight. Is that official? Is Jamie Drysdale back tonight? It looks like he is. Big news, man. Big news. Because we got the Fly Guys. They've held the third seed in the Metropolitan Division since January 24th. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. We got a violation here. We got a violation in the chat on TikTok, or excuse me, on YouTube. My man Dave Laprati loves the Eagles, but it's been a Braves fan since 1982 because of the time I got cable. Laprati. And I like Dave Laprati. You're here every week, every day. Oh, man, I can't get behind this, David. I can't get behind it. You can't go to an Eagles game in an Eagles jersey in October and then walk across the street to Citizens Bank Park, take off the Eagles jersey, and put the Braves jersey on to watch the Braves play the Phillies in the postseason. That, that's a major violation, man. Major violation. I don't know, Laprati. I don't know. Anyway, Fly Guys, only seven games left. They went through that tough stretch. And then they were supposed to start winning some games. And now they're 0-3-1. and They lose 5-1 to the Chicago Blackhawks on Saturday night, one of the worst teams in the NFL. Excuse me, NHL. And now for the first time since January 24th, they fall out of the third seed in the Metro. So they're sitting there holding on right now to the final wild card spot. They're still up on the Red Wings. The problem is the Red Wings have a game in hand. So the Fly Guys have a huge game tonight against the New York Islanders. Huge game. So Jamie Drysdale being back is a big, big announcement. Because he helps, not only does he help your back end, he helps you on the power play. Because these guys have hit a wall. They look like they have hit a wall with how hard they play. And it would be devastating. I know they've exceeded all expectations. More so than any of us could have ever imagined they've exceeded. But to hold a playoff spot the entire season, essentially, to lose it down the stretch would be devastating. This team needs to make the playoffs. I need to be in the building for playoff hockey in South Philadelphia. So tonight's a big one. Have they announced who the starting goalie is tonight? Because could it be Ivan Fedotov? And that's how we pronounce it, right? 
I've been calling him Fedotov, but I'm hearing it's Fedotov. That's going to take a little while to get used to. Fedo- Fedotov. <laughs> Ivan Fedotov. 6'7". Guy looks massive. If you watch some of the pregame before the Blackhawks game, because he was the backup goalie, guy looks massive in that. And I'm seeing now in the chat people debating whether or not you can be a Eagles fan and then be a fan of another team. See, here's the way I look at it, okay? And on the Fanatic on Sunday, I had a Dallas Cowboys fan call me, and we were going at it because he's from New Jersey. I said, hey, when did you move to New Jersey from Dallas? He's like, oh, don't shame me. I've been a Dallas fan for 20 years. If you grew up in this area, then I think it is a major violation to be a fan of any other team in any other sport over your own teams. You could like other teams. You could like other teams. I'm not saying that. But to be a diehard fan of another team over your own city's team, to me, is a violation. Now, if you grew up in Dallas and you're a Cowboys fan, I don't have a problem with that. But if you grew up in Philly, if you grew up in South Jersey and you're a Cowboys fan, major violation. There's something wrong with you. You grew up here, but you're a Yankees fan. There's something wrong with you. If you grew up here and you like a team other than the Flyers in the NHL, there's something wrong. Same thing with basketball. Being a Celtics fan or Golden State Warriors over the over the Sixers, there's something wrong. And it's also crazy to me that a majority of the people who like the Cowboys somehow like the Yankees and the Lakers. It's crazy how that works, isn't it? So I think there's a violation. You grew up in another town, you're allowed to like those teams. That's fine. But if you grew up here, Now, I will make one caveat to that. If you grew up in Philly, but your whole family was from New York and you moved here and you're just following the team that your parents liked or your grandparents liked, I'm okay with that too. But it's the people who have zero connection to New York or LA or Dallas or wherever it is and you like that team. Then there's something wrong. You see, I don't understand that. Steel City on TikTok. He's a Sixers fan, a Phillies fan, a Flyers fan, and a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. How'd that happen? How'd that happen? And look, like I'm saying, if you said, hey, I root for the Steelers, but just not when they play the Eagles because the Eagles are my number one team, I'm okay with it. You could like other teams, but not over your own team, not where you grew up. So Steel City says his parents were Steelers fans. See, that one I can get a, I can get behind a little bit. You follow what your parents did. Anyway, big game for the Flyers tonight. Big game. I already put in, I've already, see, this is what always scares me with the way playoffs work. But the Flyers already reached out to me as a season ticket holder and said, hey, do you want to opt in for the playoff tickets? So I already opted in. But they don't know if they're going to make it. But you got to do this in advance. Hope I didn't jinx anything. I'm sending the email during the Blackhawks game. They're getting crushed. And I'm like, you know, I'm opting in to my playoff tickets. That we don't even know if they've made the playoffs yet. But anyway, I'm hoping Fly Guys can bounce back tonight. And they get some days off. They're not back in action until Friday. So they need to win the night, get a little rest. Six games left after that. Down the stretch, let's make the damn playoffs. I want some playoff hockey. I'll be in the building if they do it. All right. Speaking of other teams, I mentioned the Golden State Warriors, and the reason they were on my mind was because of my today in sports history. If you follow the show, you know we end every show with a today in sports history. Well, today, April 1st, April Fool's Day, and I almost got fooled because I got Twitter up over here. And, of course, you know, you see all the stupid April Fool's trades. You know, Eagles Nation just puts up that the Eagles traded Devontae Smith. (laughs) Ha ha, April Fool's. Get out of here. Anyway. Hate those April Fool's jokes. But anyway, 
April Fools, April 1st, 2016, we were talking about the Golden State Warriors. The Golden State Warriors 54 game home winning streak, an NBA record ended April 1st, 2016 to the Boston Celtics. But how crazy, how crazy good was that Golden State Warriors team? They won 54 straight home games, an NBA record, but it ended today, April 1st, 2016. And that's another team now. See, when we grew up, like I'm 40, so when I grew up, the Dallas Cowboys were really good. And if you didn't know, they haven't made a championship game since 1995. But when I grew up, the Cowboys were good. They were winning lots of Super Bowls. So there's a lot of people from my generation who get referred to as cockroaches who grew up here who became Cowboys fans because they were good. And there's a bunch of bandwagon jumpers. Well, now what I'm seeing is the younger generation, the kids who are like 15, 16, going into high school, well, the team that they now are bandwagon jumpers on is the Golden State Warriors. Nobody cared about the Golden State Warriors until they became dominant in the mid-2010s when Steph Curry and winning 54 games in a row at home, and now there's all, this, all these Golden State Warriors fans. Same thing applies. Same thing applies. Anyway, I appreciate everybody here. Hit that like button for me. Hit that share button for me. Let's support Phillies Flyers today. Phillies against the Reds. Fly guys against the Islanders. It's a fun time to be a Philly sports fan, but it wasn't a great week. And the move that Howie Roseman made of trading away Hassan Reddick was the wrong move. But make sure you're following along. I'll see you guys tomorrow, 10 o'clock, right here on the Philly Sports Power Hour. Everybody have a great day. And as always, go Birds.